این دوتا هم دو I think we're going to start it. Good morning. I see my colleague uh, Carol Shushani Sherfani from um, the Arab Center for Climate Change Policy, ESCOA, with me. My name is Leticia Rosano. I'm the director of the Asian and Pacific Center for the Development of Disaster Information Management, APTIM, of the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Um, um, don't worry, don't worry. It, our titles will not take the whole time of the webinar, although we do have, uh, we represent large organi organizations with uh, very meaningful titles. Okay, you just saw a presentation, a video presentation um, uh, of some photographs that uh, we, um, uh, we we thought could, could be helpful to introduce the conversation and uh, and the discussion today. Um, maybe I can ask my colleague Ava to put up on the screen the agenda for today. Uh, this is a webinar on enhancing, understanding, and expanding interregional and regional cooperation on sand and dust storms. 
we have a rich agenda, uh, so I will not uh, speak for, for long at all. Um, uh, but our aim is to um, give an understanding of what the phenomenon looks like at regional level, especially focusing on the impact um, and also uh, that it has uh, and also uh, showcase some example for uh, regional collaboration, collaboration at regional level, hearing what's happening in the rest of the world on this topic. And of course, very much looking forward to also hearing um, the countries experience, the countries from the region and um, their experience directly on this matter through a panel discussion. Maybe I'll just spend two words to say about APTIM. Our vision is an effective disaster risk information, the production of effective disaster risk information for uh, sustainable development in Asia and Pacific. We work with partners to reduce human and material losses due to natural hazards and contribute to the effective design, investment and implementation of risk reduction strategies and resilience policies. Um, we are a regional institution, as I said earlier, of, uh, of the Economic Commission for Asia and Pacific, ASCAP, and uh, we are, uh, our center is based in Tehran, in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And with these brief uh, words of introduction, I will ask uh, my colleague, uh, Carol, uh, to take over. Thank you, Leticia, and good morning uh, to everyone. At least we're somewhat, I think, all in the same time zone, so I think we're all in the morning time, <laughs> even though this is a global webinar. Um, I'm Carol Shushani Sherfain. I'm director of the Arab Center for Climate Change Policies at ESQA, which, like es ESCAP, is a regional commission that serves um, member states uh, largely for us in the Arab region. And um, we were really very pleased to be part of this collaboration because this is really the first time that we're going to be able to highlight interregional stressors and stories that are affecting collaboration under the framework of the United Nations um, Coalition on Combating da Dust and Sandstorms. And we are very pleased to actually have with us today Feras uh, Zaydat, who is serving as the chair of our um, United Nation Umbrella Coalition for uh, Fostering Greater Cooperation under the working group that both Listicia and um, Esqua, ESCAP and ESQA chair on enhancing regional collaboration um, for combating and addressing and assessing, to be frank. We are still very much at the assessment phrase um, for assessing and addressing um, the challenges faced by sand and dust storms uh, throughout our region. So with that, I'm very pleased actually to turn over to Feras. I don't see him on the screen. Are you uh, on Feras? <laughs> Pop good up morning. your video if you are. There you are. Yeah, good morning, everyone. We don't see your video. Can you maybe uh, open your, your now, video if you would like, better. if not? Now can you see me, no? Yes, yes, because, wonderful. Yeah, I have my video yeah. on and uh, I will uh, thank you very much and good morning for everyone. Uh, thanks to Letizia and Carol for the introduction. Uh, maybe I, I can I share a few slides just to talk about quickly the uh, uh, let me see if I can uh, quickly do that. Uh, I can share the uh, or maybe uh, this is uh, taking some time. Okay. Can you see the presentation? No. Sure. Not yet. Make if other okay. would, oh, there we are. Uh, sorry for the time it takes. Um, I hope it come up. Otherwise, I can proceed without the presentation. It's clear. Go ahead, Faraz, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, need to. Can okay. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can see it perfectly. It's okay. Uh, so uh, this is just to give an idea of the uh, coalition of sand and dust storm, which is a global uh, United Nation uh, coalition for uh, combating sand and dust storm impact. And this is because the UN realizes the massive concern of the sand and dust storms 
on uh, different sectors. And the, the, uh, the sand and dust storms are really undermining the achievement of the, uh, uh, I don't know what happened, but let me, let me proceed maybe without the slides. Uh, the, the main idea is that uh, the, the UN uh, General Assembly resolution on 2018 asked for a global response on sand and dust storms. And uh, the, the coalition, the uh, United Nations Sand and Dust Storm Coalition was launched in the side event of the UNCCD uh, number 14th on New Delhi in 2019, with more than 15 UN entities and intergovernmental organization and affiliated members as part of the uh, coalition. And uh, in the third coalition, uh, the coordination of the coalition was moved from UNEP, who established the uh, coalition with the uh, United Nations entities, uh, ISCAP, is, is, ISQA, all uh, uh, different uh, UNCCD and other UN organizations, WMO, WHO, I mentioned some, but uh, more are there. And uh, the, the coalition now is coordinated by uh, FAO. Uh, in the coalition, there are five uh, working groups, one on adaptation and mitigation, which is co-led by UNDP and FAO, one uh, by on forecasting and early warning, uh, led by WMO. Feras, if you don't mind, maybe Ava, can you just press the slides so we get to the one that Feras is talking about? It's easier for participants. Just keep going, keep going. I'm sorry. Okay. Keep going. Next and Okay. Yes. So uh, this is to introduce uh, the uh, non-UN uh, partner. In the fifth uh, meeting, we have introduced. Uh, uh, sorry, let me continue the working group. There is one in policy and governance, uh, which is led by UNCCD. One on health and safety by WHO, and one on mediation and regional collaboration by ISCAP and ISCO. Uh, and we work together with other members of the UN uh, coalition. Uh, there is now, uh, we are preparing the uh, report for the Secretary General on uh, the sand and dust storm with more focus on the COVID and the effect of uh, sand and dust storms on the health. Uh, finally, if you can go please for the next slide. Uh, the UN coalition identified some priorities and activities that need attention and work among the members of the coalition. One in enhancing the visibility and raising awareness. This workshop uh, and webinar is very important for this and part of this work. Uh, we are also working on facilitating sharing of knowledge and information, which is very important to exchange knowledge among countries and regions to understand the mitigation and adaptation to sand and dust storms, and then to formulate a large program to mitigate the impact uh, and source of sand and dust storm, and also to enhance forecasting and early warning tools, which is also in collaboration with members of the coalition that uh, today you will hear a different uh, entries, which is part of the uh, overall uh, strategy of the coalition. And finally, resource mobilization, which is uh, also among the members. So with this, I would like to stop to give the chance for uh, the fruitful and, and, and other uh, presentation to be presented. I hope that is useful. Thank you, and I wish you a very uh, successful webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, for the introduction and um, and your remarks about the coalition. Uh, and I would now give the floor to my colleague, uh, Mustafa Mohaget, who is the senior coordinator in APDEM, who will uh, moderate our first uh, session. Mustafa, over to you. Uh, thank you, Leticia, and thanks uh, to all opening speakers for the enlightening and very rich uh, introductions. I'm pleased to moderate the first part of this webinar, which is more on the technical and the substantive side, uh, together with the other colleagues. So without going to further introductions, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Ami Shamsedini, Program Officer in the Asian Pacific Center for Development of Disaster Information Management, APTIM, uh, to make his uh, presentation 
regarding sand and dust storm risk assessment in Asia and the Pacific. After this presentation, we will have another presentation from ACCP colleagues, uh, and then we will have a chance and time for questions and answers and comments by all the participants. Uh, thanks for your attention, Mr. Shamsuddini. I mean, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mustafa. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Amin Shamsuddini working as a program officer at Aptim. Uh, let me share my screen. OK, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. I mean, we can see. Okay. The Great. Uh, if you have uh, lived in uh, any arid or semi-arid uh, area, uh, you of course uh, have experience of sand and dust storm and what you might call it uh, dusty weather. Uh, the overall aim of this uh, project that uh, I will uh, briefly talking about today is to increase our understanding uh, of the impact of this phenomenon with a uh, view of uh, facilitate conversation at regional uh, at regional level uh, toward increasing the uh, resilience. Uh, the analysis we did for this uh, assessment uh, underscored that there is a significant gap between the research and knowledge at technical level and its uh, application at the policy and investment level. Uh, I believe Nick uh, later today will will explain with more details about these challenges. Uh, we are happy to contribute uh, to this conversation in our small way. And uh, this project, this risk assessment, uh, was very uh, important for Aptim, uh, not only because the the actual issue, but uh, because the remarkable experience of working closely with uh, multiple partners. Uh, and uh, we hope to replicate this uh, practice for other future projects. I would like to start uh, from the sand and dust storm related mandate to ESCAP and APTIM in particular. The uh, General Assembly in 2016 acknowledged the role of UN system in promoting intergovernmental cooperation to combat uh, sand and dust storms. Uh, in the same year, there are two other official documents, ESCAP resolution, which uh, requested the Secretariat to promote regional and interregional networking on the uh, sand and dust storm, and also uh, APTIM, uh, the first governing council that uh, suggests APTIM can serve as a repository for a geospatial database on sand and dust storm in ESCAP uh, subregions. The role of APTIM in developing human and institutional capacity is in disaster information management, also uh, recognized in the 2017 uh, Tehran Ministerial Declaration on Combating Sand and Dust Storms. <clears throat> the report uh, organized in five chapter, as you can see in the screen. Uh, an introduction on sand and dust storm in Asia Pacific, uh, its links to uh, sustainable development goals and intergovernmental mandates. The second chapter is uh, about the methodology, which uh, we explain the risk framework and how to measure risk in uh, various sectors. Uh, the third one, uh, basically the core chapter, is the sectoral risk analysis. Chapter four is on uh, projection of sand and dust storm in the region and the economic loss. And the last chapter, chapter five, is about the findings of the study as well as suggested a next step for a coordinated regional action on the uh, sand and dust storm. I will explain uh, briefly all this information. In order to uh, find out the practical methodology to conduct this assessment, given the significant data limitation, as I mentioned, we held uh, at the very outset, uh, in collaboration uh, with the uh, World Methodological Organization, a focused technical workshop uh, focusing precisely on the possible methodologies. Uh, we uh, brought uh, experts from various backgrounds, including risk modelers, experts on sand and dust storms, uh, society economists, 
and the later we continue to uh, this discussion in a weekly basis with some of them. In this study, uh, as you can see in the screen, uh, uh, various uh, sector uh, were assessed, agriculture, energy, uh, particularly uh, solar, and environment, health, and cities and uh, transportation, uh, particularly on aviation. Uh, to do the assessment, uh, we uh, use the uh, concept of uh, risk uh, from uh, disaster risk reduction community and also concept of vulnerability from the uh, climate change adaptation approach, uh, taking best of both. We selected an indicators and uh, layers for each of the components for each sector, uh, wherever the uh, data was available, we tried to assess the risk and for some sectors due to lack of data and literature, we uh, just calculated the exposure. Now a quick look at the uh, data sources. For hazard, uh, we use the uh, Meratur reanalysis data set in ground level as well as the cruise elevation for only aviation sector. And based on the uh, way and the mechanism of impact of sand and dust storm on various sector uh, with support of uh, Tohoku University. Uh, we extracted hazard layer for each and all sectors. Uh, for example, for energy sector, we use the average annual dust deposition, uh, which covered the power plant and reduced the efficiency. And for example, for human health, we use the average daily dust concentration where it exceed uh, 50 microgram per cubic meter. Uh, for the data of uh, various sectors, we used uh, some open source data as well as uh, reached out to the uh, specialized organization and offices that uh, you can see in the slide. Uh, sand and dust storm uh, directly affects, uh, directly and indirectly affect uh, 11 out of 17 uh, sustainable development goals. It's, uh, it can adversely impact uh, poverty in uh, a community in numerous ways. It can negatively impact on the food security by uh, intensifying the damage to their uh, livelihood, to food security of uh, millions of small uh, farmers and uh, pastoralists, and uh, as well as damaging to agricultural infrastructure. Uh, so it can uh, directly impact the, the production, uh, agricultural production. Uh, in turn, uh, become a major limitation to the second sustainable development uh, goal, the uh, uh, end of hunger by 2030. And it also impact on the health and well-being, uh, it impact on the environment and uh, water resources, its uh, impact on safe and affordable drinking water uh, to cities uh, and also to resilience. In, uh, it also impact on the uh, life below water and on land, uh, actually both positively and negatively. Okay, now I'm going through the different sector and our uh, findings. In human health, uh, sand and dust storm uh, damage to uh, human organs, uh, particularly on skin and lung. The impact of sand and dust storm uh, is higher in uh, vulnerable uh, group, including children, elderly people, and uh, people with uh, pre-existing conditions. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, population at risk of sand and dust storm here. The hazard layer was uh, calculated based on the WHO air pollution guideline and defined as the average number of days annually when the level of dust uh, deposition, uh, dust concentration exceeds 50 microgram per cubic meter. Uh, for the uh, exposed component of risk, uh, we consider, I mean, the, the human, we consider the population and uh, for the uh, sensitivity, we use the subnational uh, human development index and the population of children and elderly people. We also try to include uh, gender sensitivity, but uh, considering that it was a regional study, uh, the difference was uh, negligible. 
For the uh, resilience, we use the public and private expenditure on health sector. As you can see, uh, the highest number of people located in medium to high, the concentration areas are in India, Pakistan, and uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, China. And when we normalize based on the total population per country, then uh, Turkmenistan, uh, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, uh, shows the highest exposure. You can see the countries in the uh, in the graph in the uh, below of the screen. The next one is urban area, although it is uh, not a sector, but uh, since a big amount of population uh, in the region are uh, living uh, in a comparatively comparatively uh, a small city area, we consider city as well. The urban area are packed of population, infrastructures, and services which can negatively impact by the sand and dust storm, impact on human health, uh, impact on, I mean, uh, interruption and pressure on the services, including health sector, uh, closure of uh, schools, airport, and many more. Uh, the, uh, it can also uh, damage to uh, critical infrastructures in the cities. And the other aspect is uh, the cleaning cost, uh, which uh, in some cases are relatively uh, big. Uh, in this slide, this uh, shows the exposure of uh, cities in Asian Pacific. Uh, to sand and dust storm, we consider dust exposure in cities with a population higher than uh, 300,000 in this uh, map and graph. You can see the uh, population size by the size of the circles and the color shows the level of uh, dust. The graph uh, shows the cities in Asia Pacific uh, with the highest risk. Uh, you can see the y-axis is the population and the x-axis is the average number of dusty days per year. And that's uh, it is exit uh, 50 microgram per cubic meter, obviously. And as you can see, the city of Ahwaz in the Islamic Republic of Iran, Hyderabad and Multan in Pakistan are exposed to the dangerous level of dust based on the WHO guideline uh, for more than two thirds of the year. Next one is energy sector. Uh, the most uh, damage and loss in, uh, is on the uh, solar and wind energy. I mean, it's directly impact, but uh, of course, uh, the other energy infrastructure are also uh, negatively impacting by sand and dust storms. As you can see in the infographic, uh, sand and dust storm can absorb uh, solar radiation. It increased the cost of maintenance and damage uh, by damaging the electronic, uh, electrical and mechanical instruments. It increased the cost of uh, cleaning, uh, reduced the energy production, particularly on solar panels. And in this study, basically, uh, we focused on the energy loss of solar power plant due to uh, energy efficiency reduction. This one uh, shows the exposure on the impact of sand and dust storms in the energy sector. Uh, for this analysis, the indicator uh, we used was the, the level of dust deposition, which uh, covers the solar power plant and reduce the efficiency of uh, generators. The map on the left uh, shows the location and the level and the colors shows the level of dust deposition in the, each power plant. And the map on the right uh, is the average uh, amount of uh, energy pro pro produced based on the capacities of total solar power plant in each country and the percentage of energy loss due to uh, efficiency reduction that happened due to the sand and dust storms. You can see a country like Pakistan, uh, India, Turkmenistan, China have a big circle with dark colors. Next sector is uh, transport. Sand and dust storm uh, also have a big impact on this sector uh, by reducing the visibility. Uh, it increased the, uh, I mean, reducing the visibility caused the car accidents, traffic jam, 
and uh, also flight cancellation and delays. Uh, it damaged uh, vehicle surface uh, and also uh, due to erosion of sand and dust storm, it can, uh, uh, we can expect some damage to aircraft engine, road uh, surface and also uh, traffic signs. Uh, in this study, actually, we uh, focus on the negative impact of sand and dust storm on the aviation sector only. I mean, uh, you have yes. two minutes left. I mean, sorry. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, there are uh, two main mechanisms through which uh, sand and dust storm impact this sector. The first one is due to uh, low visibility, as I mentioned. In the, uh, we use the threshold of 1,000 meter visibility to generate this one. Uh, at the left map, you can see the location of airport in the region and the level of uh, visibility in the airport. And in the middle one, the middle map, you can see the level of resiliency based on the navigation instruments in each airport. And by concluding these two, we got the risk map, risk of uh, flight cancellation and delay. Uh, the other mechanism that uh, uh, sand and dust storm can impact on navigation uh, on uh, aviation sector is the uh, risk of erosion to aircraft engine and uh, we use the uh, level of uh, dust concentration on uh, cruise elevation and come up with this uh, result you can see the um, highest uh, risk of erosion you can see in the highlighted uh, uh, paths the next sector is agriculture. As you can see uh, in this infographic, there are uh, many ways that sand and dust storm can impact this sector. Uh, it negatively impact on the livestock, uh, honey harvesting, uh, loss to I mean the the loss of soil, and uh, filling the channels and many more ways. And in this study, actually uh, we we calculate the exposure of uh, dust in uh, agricultural land. We use the the land cover map based on the MODIS data. We overlay the average dust deposition and analyze the, the agricultural land. At the right side of the screen, you can see the exposure of agricultural land to average dust deposition. You can see Turkmenistan, Pakistan, Uzbekistan have the highest exposure. Uh, the next one is environment. It also uh, can impact in uh, many ways by reducing the sun rays and also I would like to mention by covering the, the uh, glaciers and changing the melt ratio. Uh, the map on the left, uh, you can see the glacier exposed to the sand and dust storms and uh, the most uh, noticeable feature of this map is the large exposure of glacier exposed to high and very high dust deposition it can uh, basically change the hydrologic regime. And so we can expect some uh, flood, uh, water security and late uh, season droughts. Findings. Uh, we have uh, two kinds of findings. Uh, you can go for the details in the report. But for, uh, for instance, more than 80% of entire population of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Pakistan, and Tajikistan, Turkmenistan are exposed to a high level of uh, poor air quality. Uh, cities in south uh, southwestern Asia have the highest exposure of uh, dust storm, uh, where nearly 16 million people are exposed to a sand and dust storm for more than 170 days. And also a large area of farmland uh, are affected, particularly on Central Asia, which the uh, risk would be higher because of the, you know, the, uh, for example, caton are very sensitive to dust. And as I mentioned, the exposure to aircraft uh, also and the flight is another result. And in the long term also, as I mentioned, uh, we have the high dust deposition in the Himalaya Hindu Kush area. It's the, uh, considered as third pole and provide water and energy to 1.3 billion people in Asia. And also we expect it to have increase in the uh, uh, sand and dust storm by 2030 due to the uh, extreme drought condition in some part of the region. Uh, there are uh, three key areas around uh, which uh, our report identified possible collaboration for countries in the SCAP region going forward. 
as the analysis uh, throughout the report clearly point out, uh, there is a need to gain deeper understanding of the socioeconomic impact of sand and dust storm. The report goes into some details, and I believe uh, later in this webinar, we will hear from Nick Middleton on this topic. Clearly, there is also a scope for further collaboration around uh, coordinated monitoring and of sand and dust storms and early warning system, including uh, uh, with uh, an impact-based focus uh, to timely forecast STS. And finally, the report identified the specific geographic area and sectors that would benefit from coordinated action among the countries in their region to mitigate some of the most critical risks posed by sand and dust. And uh, last but not least, uh, this assessment uh, couldn't happen without the enormous support from uh, our partner. You can see the list of a few here. The details will be available in the acknowledgement part of the session, uh, the report once it's released. And my last slide, uh, I would like to uh, pr uh, use this opportunity to promote one of the Aptin products. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, during the study, we found out that there is a big gap uh, on the recording damage and loss. So we produced this one. Uh, so you can download this guideline and if uh, you need any help, Aptin will be available to, to support. Thank you very much. Sorry for the extent longer. Uh, thank you very much, I mean, for your informative presentation. A lot of stuff and technical knowledge and research results are there. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll have a chance at the end of this part for questions and comments. But uh, let me go directly to our next uh, speaker, Marlen Ann Tomaskiewicz. I hope I pronounced your name uh, close to a uh, correct one. Uh, who is regional advisor for GIS uh, for climate change analysis in Arab Center for Climate Change Policies in ESQA. And uh, we'd like to invite her to make a presentation. Please go ahead, Marlon. Thank you so much, Mustafa. Um, let me share my presentation here. Uh, can you see it? Can you see my presentation? Not yet. Not yet. Not, not yet. Yeah. And let me share it here. Let's see here. Share it again. Now you should see it. Yeah, uh, we can see it. Uh and uh, Katie, if you can make your presentation in 15 minutes as planned. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So good morning again, everybody. Um, my name is Marlene Temeskevich. I serve as regional advisor for GIS for climate change analysis. My role here at ESQA is to uh, take the climate modeling outputs and interpret and analyze them and link them to other geospatial data sets for different analyses in different sectors. With this, we're going to build on what the study Amin just presented and uh, build upon it to link uh, climate change analysis into sand and dust storms um, to assess whether we expect them to increase in frequency, whether we expect them to increase in intensity, et cetera. And this analysis is very, very preliminary. So I'm going to give uh, some overview as well as some preliminary results. For those of you who are not familiar with RECAR, RECAR is a regional initiative for the assessment of climate change impacts on water resources and socioeconomic vulnerability in the Arab region. Uh, this is an uh, initiative that was established in 2010. It is uh, coordinated by ESQA, but is a partnership of 11 different organizations from across the region and beyond. And um, we are grateful to those uh, from the Swedish government who are in support of this initiative. As part of the initiative, we established the Arab Domain, and which the Arab Domain is important because it helped uh, establish a regional domain to establish for climate change modeling from across the Arab region, from uh, North Africa, Morocco, all the way across to the Arab Peninsula, Iraq, as well as contributing transboundary waters in, uh, in the region. 
as part of this initiative, we uh, release climate change results. For example, here is the change in temperature for RCP 4.5 at the top row and RCP 8.5, a more severe scenario in the bottom row. And as you can see, for mid-century, the, uh, the period from 2046 to 2065, we can increase, expect an increase in temperature across the region of about two degrees. And this is compared only to a reference period of uh, 1986 to 2005, which is fairly recent history. We're not comparing to uh, pre pre-industrial area or 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 you know earlier. We're comparing to fairly recent history. So um, you know, in the not so far future, we can expect an, a temperature increase of two degrees or more. By the end of century, we can expect a uh, much more dramatic increase. And for example, uh, for RCP 8.5 by end of century, we can expect a temperature increase across the region of five degrees or more. So um, this is quite significant and can play a significant role in uh, sand and dust storms. Our report for RECAR was initially released in 2017. And even though a report was released, there was not a an end. It was more argu arguably a beginning. RECAR is ongoing. It's an ongoing initiative. One of the initial gaps in our report that was released in 2017, we had a gap of sand and dust storms. And, and because of this, we are looking to study further and analyze, analyze sand and dust storms with um, our current analysis and, and going forward. Some of the drivers of sand and dust storms that are climate related include land degradation, including unsustainable land and water use, vegetation decline, land loose changes. It includes desertification, uh, greater aridity, drier soils, water diversion. And what are my primary focus? Climate change, including higher air temperatures, less, precip less, precip excuse me, less precipitation and drought, and uh, stronger winds. In that regard, I'm happy to show that I recently published a paper. Um, actually, it was actually published about a week ago, so it's very, very recent um, on seasonal drought frequency. And for example, uh, here are the uh, spring and fall seasons for drought for across the region using uh, the standardized precipitation index. And you can see, for example, at by end of century, we can expect severe, severe drought, particularly in spring here on the North African coast and Morocco, uh, Algeria. Um, and then there are some areas, particularly in Iraq, um, going into Iran as well, of areas we can expect seasonal drought in the spring, which, which can potentially play role for a significant role in terms of sand and dust storms. With that, I want to focus particularly on the MeshRec domain. And we established a domain, and I'll be shortly, shortly sharing with you climate modeling results from the MeshRec domain. We call it the MeshRec domain, but it transcends beyond the what is conventionally known as the MeshRec, and includes several, several countries as listed here on the right, um, in, including uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, Oman, uh, Yemen, and, and which are particularly vulnerable to sand and dust storms and can play a significant role. As you can see here on this slide, this area in the Meshrek is uh, particularly vulnerable to sand and dust storm frequency. The larger circles represent higher frequency. This is a study done uh, in 2015, and it shows meteor uh, sand and dust storm frequency established from meteorological stations between 2000 and 2013. The larger circles represent higher frequency of dust storms. And for example, here in, in Eastern Saudi Arabia, in Iraq, in Iran, um, some high frequency of sand and dust storms. And e e Amin alluded to this in his previous presentation as well. So with our MeshRug domain, we primarily, one of the primary goals was to establish a finer spatial resolution of climate data sets. The, the Arab domain data that I previously showed was relevant at a regional scale. It was a 50 kilometer grid, which you can see here on the left. But while that is uh, sufficient for regional analysis, 
a, a finer detail of analysis is necessary for more detailed studies, including sand and dust storms, um, which and the metric data sets are data that are available at a 10 kilometer grid. And I just have an, these graphics to, so you can kind of get a feel of how the difference in level of detail these, these gridded data sets are. Also with the metric domain, we have multiple sand and dust, uh, multiple climate parameters that were analyzed. For RECAR, we primarily focused on, um, on temperature and precipitation, as well as precipitation and temperature related extreme climate indices, as well as hydrological impacts, because the initial initiative was focusing primarily on water resources in the Arab region. These new metric climate dam new metric domain climate modeling data outputs entail uh, wind wind speed and direction, wind gust, evaporation, radiation, and other different parameters that could be more suitable for a much more wider ranging of uh, analyses, including sand and dust storms. Um, we do have bias corrected temperature and precipitation. The other data sets are not bias corrected, but all can be utilized for uh, an assessment. For those of you who are not familiar with bias correction, what it entails in general is taking these climate modeling outputs and integrating them with observed data sets to basically improve the results of, of uh, the climate modeling outputs. The metric uh, data sets include um, the period from 1961 to 2070. They are based on the most updated uh, climate modeling outputs that uh, climate modeling technology that is available, CMIP6. Um, we primarily, for this initial analysis, we focused on the SSP 8.5 climate scenario. For those of you who are familiar with climate scenarios, you may be familiar more so with RCP 8.5, which is considered an extreme scenario. The SSP integrates uh, socioeconomic uh, scenarios into these RCPs. So again, this is also the worst case scenario, which is suitable for planning purposes and uh, other reasons. And for this, we uh, assessed six different climate uh, models, um, whereas for RECAR, we only used three climate models. So it uh, helps facilitate a much more robust assessment and, uh, and of an analysis. Here's a listing of the climate models, the six different global climate models that were downscaled. Again, these are based on CMIP6, the most uh, current and uh, models that are available. You can see they're, you know, they're very, very recent, as recent as 2020. Um, and we are thankful to our partners at SMHI who took these models and mm. these models were selected primarily um, based on testing and based on uh, uh, best assessment for the area. And they were downscaled using this, uh, so the, the Aladdin model for, for our analysis. I'm pleased to share with you these results. You are actually the first audience to see the metric domain re results. Um, we have different periods that we analyzed. We have a new established baseline period uh, based on CMIP6 from 1995 to 2014. And we uh, studied uh, both near term and midterm. You can see an increase of uh, about one degree at midterm, excuse me, at near term expected compared to the baseline. Again, very, very recent history. And we are currently in the near term, as well as midterm where we can expect an increase temperature of increase of two degrees, three degrees in, or more. As I mentioned, we also assess uh, wind speed. For example, these are mean change in daily maximum wind speed compared to baseline. Um, you can see areas in the bluish are decreases in maximum wind speed and areas increasing in wind speed, which would be particularly relevant for sand and dust storms here in, in the brown colors, which is we, we expect uh, wind speed to increase, uh, particularly in the Southern Arabian Peninsula. So here are some results for some selected subdomains. You can see temperature increases of about one degree overall at mid-century, excuse me, at near, near, near term, as well as about two degrees at mid-century. And then uh, 
the wind speed increases are not so much of a change, but at a much more localized level can have some significance. And I just wanted to highlight uh, the area of largest increase here along the um, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, coastline here with the largest increase, the largest changes of temperature. So some of the next steps we are going to conduct. Um, I wanted to emphasize that seasonal forecasting is conducted twice a year by the Arab Climate Outlook Forum. And the Climate Outlook Forum, Arab Climate Outlook Forum is an intergovernmental process launched under the Council of Ministers responsible for meteorology and climate under the League of Arab States. Um, we will also be doing seasonal climate modeling outputs under RECARD. The, uh, the outputs I showed previously were based on annual data sets. Um, particularly relevant for sand and dust storms are more analyzing data sets at a seasonal level. We're going to evaluate uh, national uh, sand and dust storm trends and frequency analyses to identify proxy parameters and link these to both regional and interregional trends. Um, of course, both climate and sand, sand and dust storms are not controlled by borders. They, they transcend borders. They transcend the region and go into uh, across other regions. So we we are looking to do um, more linkage to interregional trends as well as regional. And we will also do a remote sensing analysis to uh, analyze uh, historical events, historical sand and dust storms, and link these to climate modeling outputs. And from there, we will uh, make uh, other assessments and um, Again, the overall goal is to assess whether or not uh, we can expect sand and dust storms to increase in frequency as well as intensity in the future. With that, I wanted to thank you and I look forward to further discussion and ideas you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marlene, for your presentation. Uh, we got uh, some time here now for questions and comments or discussion that the participants uh, would like to have. Uh, I would like to suggest please raise your hand on the bottom, the top of the page actually, uh, so that we can we can actually identify uh, the participant who would like to raise a question or share a comment. Uh, and uh, it could be regarding both, both presentations made by I mean, um, also Marlene. So please uh, feel free to uh, raise your hand and share your comments or questions. Yes, I see. Uh, yeah, Mr. Gulri is from uh, Iran. Uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, just uh, uh, very briefly a couple of points regarding uh, the uh, presentations that uh, we saw and we heard uh, this uh, morning, morning Tehran times of course. Uh, the first one is uh, to express uh, my appreciation to Abdim uh, from SCAP and the Tehran team for uh, convening this very important and timely uh, webinar on a very important topic that is uh, impacting uh, the entire region. Uh, this is uh, a very um, expected uh, and timely uh, event that uh, we are counting on and uh, this is very important that uh, we are sitting uh, together to discuss uh, this very important uh, issue. I uh, thank uh, the Mr. Moagre and the, the team for that. The second point is that we are uh, uh, extremely happy to see that uh, so many entities uh, from different regions and from different countries are gathering together to discuss this issue because uh, as we heard in uh, uh, different presentations uh, today, uh, it is uh, a transboundary um, uh, issue uh, or problem that uh, uh, that that is impacting uh, so many countries and so many regions 
we have seen in the general assembly uh, i mean we have seen in the uh, secretary general report that 151 countries uh, are involved in this uh, problem and this is uh, 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 a happy moment for us that we are seeing so many stakeholders from different countries are gathering together to discuss uh, this issue. We have seen um, the presentations and I thank uh, all those who have uh, presented uh, them uh, that uh, uh, the issue is uh, really a difficult issue and uh, we need to uh, to add our force together to address uh, uh, the issue. The first, the third uh, uh, point that I want to raise is that um, many uh, things or initiatives uh, have been done and have been carried out by different uh, resolutions of the uh, General Assembly uh, of the United Nations, also resolution in SCAP, um, uh, the Ministerial Declaration of uh, United uh, uh, Nations Environment Assembly and, and other gatherings in the world. And it shows that it is very important uh, issue that everybody has to um, take it up and to to address it. We heard from uh, the FAO that uh, uh, the coalition now has been established and uh, now is operate operational. Uh, of course, we need to add our forces, as I said before, to uh, to put all these uh, data and presentations into action. Uh, to uh, to do something for uh, for the people who are affected by by sand and dust storms, um, it, it seems to me that uh, a very important momentum now is uh, is in place, and I would like also again to thank uh, um, uh, all the participants uh, uh, to be pre present here, and uh, I think we will have a very fruitful discussion at the other uh, at the end of the day today. And uh, uh, I urge um, uh, all participants to uh, uh, prepare the ground um, wherever they are for a synergy on uh, adding the um, forces and adding the efforts uh, to deal uh, with this very difficult uh, issue. I stop there and uh, I will I will. Uh, 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 of course, I have to. I have to uh, uh, say that uh, uh, one of the uh, most important and most uh, uh, informed uh, authorities of Iran on sand and dust storms will be uh, talking to the toward the end of uh, this meeting from Department of uh, Environment. Uh, but and if there is any uh, any question or comments, uh, I also will be. Uh, ready to uh, to answer or to hear. Uh, thank you so much. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Goris, from Minister of Foreign Affairs of Islam Republic of Iran, uh, for your important points. All points are well noted and taken. And also, thank you very much for your word of support uh, to Optim and the initiative which is being taken together with uh, ESCOA. Uh, and I appreciate very much your continued support and uh, collaboration. Uh, I see there are other uh, uh, participants would like to take the floor. I wish to invite uh, Dr. Ali Darvishi, please go ahead. Uh, and uh, I would appreciate if you can make your comments or questions briefly so that we have time for more uh, interventions by the participants. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Ali Darvishi from University of Tehran. Actually, I have two questions uh, regarding Amin presentation and Malin presentation. I would like to appreciate both of them, if they can help me to understand. Uh, my first question going to Amin about, uh, as you know, uh, the vulnerability is mainly can be modeled in four domains, environment, agroecology, agro health and socioeconomy. From your point of view and from your project that you already have done, which are the main at risk or has the highest vulnerability in the in this region that you studied? My first question. My second question go to Marlene is about you have analyzed and you mentioned that 
temperature rising and also uh, the precipitation will be decreased uh, in the next, let's say, 50 years. I'm asking the question regarding the, as you know, uh, the sources of dust in three main uh, categories. Lands uh, affected uh, areas of sand and dust storm based on this raising uh, temperature and uh, decreasing precipitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ali Darvishi. I would like uh, to ask Amin, please uh, provide your brief answer to the question raised. And then we'll go to Marlin, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ali, for the question. Uh, actually, uh, regarding the which part are more vulnerable, uh, since uh, you are aware we're talking about a huge region. It's, uh, you know, from Turkey all the way to uh, eastern part of Asia and the Pacific. So uh, in the conclusion chapter, you can see the details of it, but uh, for at the moment I can say that uh, the population exposure to the risk and the, the risk is uh, more on the southern part of the Asia in uh, India, Pakistan, that region. And for agriculture, we have uh, issue in the Central Asia, in the part of China, and uh, Iran. Uh, so basically, it it's, uh, depends on which sector and which geographic area. I hope it's clear. If uh, you want more detail on that, I'll, I'm available. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Amir, for your uh, answer. May I ask uh, Marlin, please, uh, answer to the second question raised by Dr. Darbishi. Thank you. Hello, um, I, I'm so, I apologize to Dr. Ali. I did not catch the entire question, but I believe you were asking about precipitation and drought. You, you're breaking up a little bit, so it was not completely clear. But the answer is yes, we will be looking closer at precipitation in the region um, and its impact on aridity as well as drought as part of our analysis uh, to assess sand and dust storms. Um, so um, that those data sets are not quite ready yet uh, to show, but that will be part of our assessment. Okay. Sorry, uh, may, may, may I make it clear? Okay. Yes, please go ahead briefly. Okay, okay, very briefly. As I said to you, the sources of dust in the in this region are mainly from uh, three types of sources: agricultural lands, dried water bodies, the bed of dried, for example, river or marshlands, etc., and deserts. From your study, which are the main Um, we will be looking at, oh, sorry. The uh, in the future. Oh. I guess we will be looking at that. We have not done so yet. Um, again, this is, uh, this assessment is very in the preliminary stages. So we will be looking at um, water bodies and whether or not they're decreasing in surface area and their, their trends, as well as other regional trends to, um, for our assessment. So we will be doing this, yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you as we are running out of our time, I would like to invite Ms. Saeed Asarbi from Gulf Cooperation Council. I saw his, na his name, his hand was raised. Uh, please go ahead, Mr. Asarbi, if you have a, still a question or comment on the presentation made. Mr. Saeed Asarbi, are you? There, are you still wanting to raise a question or make any points? Yes, do so, Yes, please. Go ahead. So it appears that uh, we don't have a, a proper connection. I can't hear Mr. Asarmi uh, actually uh, very well. Uh, I, yeah, so uh, now I uh, see that uh, uh, there are two uh, hands uh, raised. I would like to close uh, actually uh, with these two. Yes, please. Hi, yes, it's yes. Sorry to barge in. 
I think it would sure. be best if colleagues can just write their questions in the chat line yes. and Marlene and yes. Amin can respond uh, bilaterally or through the chat because yes. we really don't have yes. enough time. Uh, maybe we can give another try exactly. uh, to the GCC representative if he wanted to come in at this point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think uh, as Leticia suggested, we better close uh, this session with the time that we have had. Of course, we have other parts and uh, presentations and chance for discussion. As mentioned, I encourage uh, participants to please write your questions in the chat box. We definitely look at them and take into consideration and provide feedback and answer, or actually raise your questions in the next parts of this webinar as the time is really tight and we want to be punctual and uh, finish the webinar on time. I appreciate very much, uh, very good uh, presentations by Amin and Marlin. Uh, very much appreciated and also very good interventions and questions by the participants. Now I would like to hand over and take the floor to Mr. Tarek Sadiq, my colleague, first economic affairs officer, climate change officer in the Arab Center for Climate Change Policies of ESCO. Uh, Tarek, you have the uh, floor. Please go ahead Thanks for the Mustafa. next part of Thanks the for... webinar. Thanks, Mustafa. Thanks for moderating this excellent session. Uh, Again, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tarek Sade. I am a, a Water Resources and Climate Change Officer at ESQA, at the Arab Center for Climate Change Policies. Uh, I have been working uh, for quite a long time with uh, met meteorological experts uh, under different uh, mechanisms in the region, and I'm glad that we are coordinating now with ESCAB our regional work and also connecting it, as you will see in this part of the meeting, to other initiatives and opportunities uh, globally, because this is the essence of the working group uh, five under the UN coalition to work on mediation and regional collaboration. So we, I hope that we can uh, look quickly. We are behind the time, but we will allow for the same time so it's uh, just shifting uh, the timing of the agenda. I already took note of the time we started uh, on, so we will keep the allocated time for the speakers uh, in the session. So uh, without any further ado, I will uh, start with the first presentation. As you see, uh, we have uh, Mr. Alexander Beklanov. Uh, he is science, science and Innovation Department. He is a professor in the department in WMO. He is well known with uh, uh, leading the work on, uh, on warning advisory and assessment system, SDS uh, was. And he will give us some idea how we can strengthen this cooperation with uh, this initiative globally. And then we will listen to Dr. Sarah Bassard on some kind of application, uh, some other applications related after all. So let me suggest to Mr. Alexander six minutes and then because we don't have uh, some time for a question, I will uh, give a question or two to participants after your presentation. So the floor is yours, Mr. Alexander, please. Thank you, Tarek, and I'll try to uh, share the screen. Yes, we can see the screen now. Please go ahead. No, it's just wrong. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's but it's the wrong presentation. <laughs> yes. Yes.
Sorry, can you share the screen from your side? Because uh, I think it's uh, something wrong uh, on, on my side. Yeah, we can see it now. This is the right one. OK, the right one. OK, that is great. Can I you see now? Because I can see it running from ever from uh, escape site. It's not from your okay. side. Okay, okay, good. Which is okay. You can just uh, please uh, ever go. This so, is the first uh, slide. Uh, my talk will be about uh, uh, sun and dust storm warning advisory system, what uh, WMO established actually uh, more than 15 years ago. And uh, it was in uh, uh, just next slide, please. Uh, it is uh, actually met meteorological phenomena, so uh, uh, WMO uh, was requested uh, uh, in 2004 uh, by more than 40 countries, uh, member countries, uh, to uh, establish such a, a global federation of partners uh, and endorse it uh, in the Congress uh, uh, in 2007, uh, um, uh, such uh, system, and which is organized uh, uh, by regional nodes. Uh, uh, including uh, uh, research and, and user community in health, climate, energy, transport, aeronautical and agriculture uh, sector users. And next slide, please. And during this 15 years, uh, WMO uh, uh, built uh, uh, quite uh, uh, a comprehensive system for uh, observation and uh, modeling and uh, prediction and assessment of sun and dust storm. Uh, globally and also regionally. As you can see here on this uh, slide, uh, uh, it includes uh, observation uh, in situ, observation, visibility and uh, particular matter and also uh, uh, remote sensing methods uh, like uh, uh, for seismometers, uh, uh, lidars uh, and uh, uh, AOD observations uh, from satellites, uh, different types of satellites. And of course, uh, in integrating uh, into uh, uh, comprehensive models for forecasting and assessments. Next slide. And uh, you, the current vision uh, of... Uh, can you please enlarge the slide and run it as a slideshow to see the maps better by the audience? Thank you. Is it done? Uh, okay. And, uh, the current uh, uh, mission is including uh, uh, establishing and coordinating such a global network of uh, sun and dust storm warning uh, uh, research and uh, forecasting centers. And uh, for the moment, we have uh, three centers. One is Barcelona. Uh, for uh, uh, Middle East, uh, uh, Europe and uh, Africa. And second is uh, uh, for Asia is uh, hosted by uh, uh, China and Beijing. And the third one uh, uh, for Americas uh, uh, hosted by Barbados and the United States. And here you can see uh, uh, what kind of product is uh, providing. First of all, it's uh, warning advisory for monitoring observation, forecasting and uh, uh, advising uh, uh, on uh, warnings. But from other side for assessment, we also provide uh, reanalysis and uh, sub-seasonal uh, uh, forecast and also climate uh, change and projections uh, for multi-year analysis. Uh, and here you can see, next slide please, and you can see a dynamic of uh, three days forecast uh, for uh, sun and dust. Uh, uh, the left picture on the top is uh, forecast by uh, Barcelona Center and from the right side, uh, uh, Beijing Center for Asia. Uh, this for actually today forecast for next three days and you can see uh, how uh, the impact. And uh, another type of product uh, below, you can see two maps uh, for global uh, uh, dust assessment uh, and for long term trends. The uh, left picture uh, gives uh, uh, average uh, um, load uh, by dust for 2020 year and the uh, right side uh, demonstrate uh, the difference uh, in, in, in comparison with climatic uh, 30 years average. Uh, and you can see here some areas are uh, uh, in red 
increasing uh, dust in some areas uh, actually decreasing so uh, signal is different uh, and uh, such type of reanalysis we also provide uh, for uh, SCAP abdim for the uh, SDS uh, risk assessment what was uh, uh, recently demonstrated uh, what kind of uh, variables uh, uh, we provide uh, in our centers so this uh, example of uh, uh, NAMI Nod and the Barcelona Center. So concentration and dust load and uh, 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 um, aerosol uh, optical depth uh, and also uh, deposition, wet deposition and dry deposition and also extinction coefficients uh, which can be used. But of course uh, uh, we are looking for end users and also providing uh, uh, sun and dust storm uh, warning advisory system for specific countries. One example is demonstrated. Next slide, please, uh, for Burkina Faso. And uh, here uh, this system is uh, uh, already uh, functioning from uh, end of uh, 2018 and used by uh, uh, national authorities uh, for uh, warning. And similar uh, work is now continued for uh, seven other countries in West Africa. Uh, and supported by uh, uh, Cruz and uh, uh, Maclima Interact. And mostly it's re realized by our NAMI Nod and Barcelona Center colleagues. Uh, of course, uh, it is important to uh, uh, go further from physical uh, uh, forecast uh, to uh, integrated and impact forecast assessment, risk management and uh, resilience capacity and finally to mitigation. And this uh, work what we are realizing together with uh, members of the uh, Sun and Dust Coalition uh, and uh, also uh, within uh, WMO uh, multi-hazard early warning system uh, concept which is demonstrated here uh, uh, focusing also on economical impact and disaster risk reduction which also was uh, uh, one of the focus for our joint study with UNEP uh, and UNCCD. And uh, the products what uh, are suggesting and uh, uh, realizing now within the coalition from SDS was uh, include for uh, on the top, next slide please, <clears throat> on the top uh, of the uh, uh, this slide you can see uh, SDS was uh, uh, providing for forecast and early warning uh, with impact on health, aviation, agriculture and economy, uh, with considering different uh, warnings. And from uh, a below picture uh, demonstrate how SDS was is uh, uh, contributing for impact assessment and uh, uh, risk assessment uh, with long term analysis, uh, uh, reanalysis uh, re and uh, 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 analysis effectiveness of different measures uh, for uh, um, combating sun and dust storm. And here also you can see what it's, uh, uh, it's uh, includes nine global models uh, contributing to SDS VAS and uh, more than 15 regional models and more than 30 organizations are involved within this three regional center. And of course, uh, many national centers are. So that's uh, a main information what I thought to provide and uh, on the next slide you can see uh, many links to our uh, uh, regional centers uh, providing uh, uh, forecast and assessment and uh, um, uh, on also uh, our uh, WMO airborne bulletins uh, which are uh, issued uh, every year and uh, the number five uh, bulletin was just issued yesterday and, uh, uh, we'll provide a bit later the uh, web link. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Alexander, Professor Alexander. Very interesting presentation, very informative. We see uh, very active network with many partners uh, looking at uh, issues related to SDS was, which is really uh, what we need to connect to our regional activities as well. Uh, now we can have a question or two for uh, Mr. Alexander. Quick ones, please, if you want to raise your hand. And who is first? Uh, 
I can see the previous uh, uh, session also participants who did not have the chance to ask. Maybe they want to ask Mr. Alexander something related to their work. Mr. Hassan. OK. Yes, Dr. Hassan, do you have any question for to Mr. Alexander? Please go ahead. No, I'm OK, sorry. OK, so we will uh, thanks Dr. Uh, Dr. Alexander again, and now we will move to the next speaker I have in the agenda, uh, Dr. Sara Bassard. She is postdoctor doctoral researcher at uh, Barcelona Dust Forecast Center, uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and she will talk about cooperation on forecasting and on modeling socioeconomic impact based on the initiatives dust claim and index. Please, uh, Dr. Sara, floor is yours. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, I hope that you can see my screen in full screen. Right? Can, can yes, we can. We can. Okay. Then thanks a lot for the introduction. And today I want to introduce a little bit the efforts that we are doing here in Barcelona, in Spain, in the WMO DAS Regional Center to go for the understanding of the user needs in risky sand and dust environments. And in our case, it's focusing in the area of North Africa, Middle East, and Europe, because it's the region where it's the regional node that we are managing. And this is a big effort, not just from partners inside the regional center. Also, there are associated projects as in DAS, those DAS Clean, the ones that you mentioned, but other projects that also contributing to these, these uh, activities. And as you can see in the image, uh, the impacts of San and Desert uh, Stones are, are very large. It's not just um, a matter of climate and environment. It's also that San and Desert Stones are impacting in socioeconomic sectors like transportation or solar energy, air quality, or even agriculture. Then it's because it's needs that the WMO, as Alexander explained in, in the previous talk, that uh, WMO launched this San Andreas Storm Warning Advisory and Assessment System, this SDS works. Basically, the objective of the program is to identify and improve the products to monitor and predict dust. And this is done working with the research and operational organizations, but also with users. Also, it's important, uh, and this is a clear commitment to use to facilitate the user access to this information. And finally, we have to work in the strength to the capacity of the countries to use this information. Then, as uh, as uh, Alex uh, explained, how is built this system is in the concept of regional nodes and centers. And nowadays, we have three nodes that are covering different regions uh, at global scale. The one in Pan America is covering the whole American continent. And there is a center that is managing the activities in Barbados. Then we have the Asian center that is covering most of Asia and part of West Asia and has a center in Beijing. And finally, we have the regional node of North Africa, Middle East, and Europe that is managed by a center in Barcelona. Because the maturity of these last two regional centers, the WMO also designate these uh, regional centers as operational centers, meaning that we have to provide operational focus for the users every day. Then basically, the concept is that we have two centers in Barcelona, and we are under the name of the Barcelona WMO Barcelona DAS Regional Center. And basically, we have to enhance the capacity of the countries in our region to use the, the information, but also we have to promote collaboration and to develop some services for the potential users. Basically, in this sense, we can put in, in promote the, the the use of the information through the maintenance of different dissemination channels, that is basically the web and the Twitter, then a large communities follow us through the social network of Twitter. But also we are promoting trainings, webinars, mobility, and also collaborative publications to try to raise this capacity building strategy. 
As you can see here, for example, there are some projects, as Alexander mentioned, that try to install some sensors in Africa, or even we are doing trainings around the region, like the one in Asbaz in 2018. Because the COVID, the trainings are now remote, but before we were having one per year, more or less. But also we are having this centralized access to observations and forecasts. And as you can see here is two examples, one from the RGB product from Eumetsat that is tracking the dust storms uh, in a qualitative way. In this case, you have to track the pink color that is the color that represents uh, the appearance of, of some potential sun and dust storms. You can see here in the slide, a nice sun and dust storm was that was starting in Algeria and covered Spain. But also we are working a lot with models, with forecast models. Nowadays we are receiving 15 global and region models that are covered in all region of North Africa, Middle East and Europe. And with this set of models, we can play with them and provide some more probabilistic products that can, that can help to the stakeholders or during stream events, for example. And when we talk with uh, about tailoring products, uh, this this the, this is the concept. We have raw scientific products that all the scientific community can understand and use as uh, concentration, the slow extinction, these nice words. But when you think in, in users, this means that you have to translate the information in some product that they will be very useful for them and very quick to understand. And here you can see two examples of products that are available in the SDS World Regional Center website. The first one is a probability map that is telling you how many models during that day will overpass the WHO uh, guideline for PM10, that is 15 micrograms per cubic meter daily average. In that way, you can see very fast the number of models that is these ensemble members and the percentage of models that are predicting this exit of this threshold. And the other example is this warning advisory system for Burkina Faso that basically is also trying to use a traffic like color to highlight the days where you will have very extreme events. And this kind of products that basically uh, design it thanks to the participation of the users. And this means a lot of interactions with them and a lot of discussion. Then the first part of the process is, is basically the user engagement and why? Because we need these potential users to enroll them in the process of the design. And I cannot hear you, Sara. Hello. I guess we uh, I don't I don't know if I have a problem myself or you Sarah cannot hear you. You, you can listen me now. Yes, now oh. I can. Yeah, please go ahead. You have Perfect. one minute, please. Okay. Then the, the users, uh, as I said, the users are very important for the identification of the impacts for specific sectors and also to raise ideas for risk mitigations. Then uh, users are fundamental by pillar in this process and how we can enroll them. And first, we, hit, we need to create interest in the topic, and this is done through workshops, meetings, and dissemination materials. And this is the work done that through this project called Latin Dust. And this, this is basically the effort of a group of people to create a network that enroll different socioeconomic uh, uh, sectors. And they are participating in workshops. We are having like more than 30 workshops science 2018, but also creating videos or leaflets and all these materials are, are available in this website. Also, we are promoting collaboration for deepening the topic and creating capacity building through the organization of trainings, webinars, and also promoting mobility through, through grants of mobility. And also, there are some experiences that you can post in, that, that you can see from interviews from grantees, and the webinars are public also. Then is a way that we can interact with the community. And finally, this is an example of the way of things that we can do in this process. The final thing we can do. The first part is to define the impacts. This is an example for aviation. 
we can define a list of impacts thanks to the stakeholders involved in the aviation sector. And once we have cleared the, the, the impacts of the sun and dust storms, we can then move to produce the products. Here you can see the two examples, one based on a climatic run that is close to the, the one, the product presented by, by Amin in his talk this morning, and it's this aircraft dust exposure, and it's basically done by a reanalysis with 10 years of data, but also we can create some daily products that will be useful for, for more short-term impacts information. And with it, just I, I want to raise the question that the last two years will be very active, at least in the region of North Africa, Europe and Middle East, in terms of dust activity. And it is clear that we need to improve our capacity to predict them, basically because we need uh, information for, for mitigate, mitigating his risk. And with it, thanks a lot. And uh, this is everything from my side. Thanks, uh, Dr. Sara. Very interesting uh, work uh, by Barcelona Center. Good to see uh, the operationalization process of uh, regional uh, nodes and centers for SDS, as well as how to use R&D as a base for, for this uh, process, and also how to tailor products to users. And this is what we really need to always have our products targeting uh, different users uh, uh, using the med services. Uh, I would allow for question, only one question, quick one, because I already had a request now, Dr. Ali, but uh, if you have any other questions, please use the chat. Dr. Ali, if you can please be so quick, uh, go ahead, 30 seconds, please, <laughs> because of the time. Dr. Ali. Uh, hello. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for your presentation. Actually, I have seen one of the, in one of slides that you mentioned that there is a, a warning advisory system. I want to know: is it just about, about the the climate or or about the meteorology, or you have another advisory example about health or something like that? Thank you. And the one that I present is the warning advisory system that we produce for Burkina Faso. And basically is a daily product that uh, is based on the definition of uh, thresholds for definition of, of uh, intensity of the events based on uh, climatology, based on the multimodal product. But it's a daily product. The thresholds are defined by a climatology for the definition of the intensity of the different levels of intensity, but the product is daily. It's forecasting. Do you have any? And the one that we have related with dust is this one that is telling you the probability to exceed the daily average uh, guideline of the WHO, that is this 50 micrograms per cubic meter PM10. And is, is, is the one that I show that is this probability map. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sara. Sorry for the short time no for the worries. question. Uh, thanks could I ask, for the invitation. Uh, thanks very much. Very interesting presentation. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Now, can I ask participants who are not talking to close their cameras because I have a problem with the quality of the sound sometimes by the speaker. So if you please uh, uh, do that. I have two more screens now open, so if you can close them. Now I will... Uh, Move to the last presentation of this uh, session uh, by uh, uh, Mr. Nicholas Middleton. He is a fellow in physical uh, geography in uh, St. Anne's College, University of Oxford, and he is a sand and dust storm expert. Uh, he will talk about socioeconomic impacts of sand and dust storms, very important issue, which is the data and knowledge gaps. These are another uh, challenge we are working uh, under the UN coalition in our working group neck. So please, if you highlight this, and can I give you seven minutes for talking and so we can have uh, some uh, discussion later. Thank you. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I will try and keep seven minutes. I was told ten, but uh, let's see. If um, you need ten. Ten Please go ahead with the 10, but we keep the questions on the chat then. It's up to you, Nick, okay? 
Can you see my screen? Yes, it's in full size. It's a great. Very thing. good. OK, thank you very much. Um, uh, my job today is to talk to you about um, uh, what we don't know as much as what we do know with regard to the um, socioeconomic impacts of sand and dust storms. Um, we've heard a lot about the, the, the hazards various that um, human societies uh, are subject to from sand and dust storms. Here's a, 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 a full menu of them, if you like, um, classified according to the three phases of the wind erosion system, entrainment, picking the material up, uh, transport, and deposition. Many of these uh, you have heard uh, about uh, to some degree in the webinar so far. Others have not yet been mentioned. Uh, in that regard, I'll highlight information and communication technology. We've heard a bit about um, diseases and uh, health. Of course, they do affect um, people, but they also affect plants and animals. Um, the other aspect I think that is worth highlighting um, from this table of all the various hazards uh, uh, that we face from sand and dust storms is the fact that there can be great distances between where material is entrained, where it's transported and where it's finally deposited. And those distances can be up to uh, thousands of kilometres. Now, um, tables like this are all uh, very nice uh, categorised um, and it helps us understand what's going on. But of course, during a sand and dust storm, many of these dis different hazards occur all at the same time. And um, I want to just uh, briefly mention a couple of very large events in the parts of the world that we've been talking about in recent years. Um, this was a huge uh, dust storm event that occurred in April. 2015 over the Arabian Peninsula and uh, in total 14 other countries. Uh, this is a satellite image of the, the milky uh, sand and dust storm area here. Um, it affected an area of over 10 million square kilometres uh, in 14 different countries. There were impacts and uh, many impacts on health, um, education, schools were closed in Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Uh, construction was stopped in the United Arab Emirates and many problems with uh, various forms of transport, particularly aviation, uh, flight delays, diversions, cancellations in numerous countries, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates, Oman, Yemen and Iran. So that was a particularly large event in the Middle East uh, some years ago. Um, more recently, there was a very large event in Mongolia and China uh, in March of this year in which eight people lost their lives. Um, about 200,000 uh, livestock perished in rural Mongolia, along with over 120 animal shelters. There was also significant damage to uh, major uh, infrastructure such as electricity, pylons and substations. Um, downwind, if you like, hundreds of flights were cancelled at uh, Beijing Airport. And then over the following day or so, there were dust health advisories um, for numerous cities and counties in uh, South Korea. So when these very big transboundary events occur, we have multiple impacts in multiple countries on multiple sectors. I just want to say a bit more about what we do and don't know on, on particularly important sectors next. Um, firstly, health. Uh, there are numerous studies, ep epidemiological studies, showing associations of dust exposure with increase in mortality and visits to hospitals and admissions to hospitals due to cardiovascular, that's um, heart problems and breathing difficulties. Numerous studies. However, Evidence is still inconsistent in different geographical areas and uh, establishing causation is still rather elusive in many regards. There are numerous health effects, physical, chemical and biological, and some are much uh, better known than others. And most of the research is on short term uh, health impacts and what we know about the long term or chronic health impacts is much less well established. And the final point on this slide uh, uh, is um, startling in that most of the health impact studies uh, relating sand and dust storms to human health 
have been conducted quite a long way from SDS source areas and not in dry land areas themselves. I'm talking about places like uh, southern Europe, uh, Korea, Japan, southern China. Um, so a long, long way from dry land areas and there's a dire need for many more of these health impact studies actually in dry land areas. Um, SDS and agriculture is a big issue, there's no question. Uh, and there are impacts both in uh, sand and dust storm source areas and in deposition areas. Uh, the, there's no question also that we need uh, much more detailed information at high spatial resolution on the nature of sand and dust storm source area locations which have been mismanaged uh, by human activity and in this case uh, agricultural activities. Um, several people have said already that there's a, a significant difference between purely natural hyper arid desert sources about which we can't really do an awful lot in the source areas so we have to mitigate the impacts uh, and on the other hand source areas that are uh, have become source areas as a result of agricultural mismanagement. Um, I think it's fairly well established that soil erosion can lead to productivity declines in agricultural areas, uh, both cropland and rangeland, but there are few quantitative or indeed economic studies of these impacts. Um, in the deposition areas, uh, dust deposition can smother plants, uh, the, the chemistry of the dust may be toxic to plants. Uh, however, the inputs can also provide nutrients both, both to plants and to uh, soils. And again, there are relatively few quantitative studies of these types of impacts. The relationship between sand and dust storms and land degradation is complex uh, and SDS uh, rapidly reduces soil organic carbon stocks. Therefore, there are links to climate change and land degradation neutrality. I uh, just want to say a little bit about um, the economic cost of impacts. Um, first thing to say uh, uh, very simply is that there haven't been many attempts to assess economic costs and most of those that have been made are, are market costs only. Uh, some estimates for individual dust events, perhaps the best known is this Red Dawn event over a large area of Eastern Australia. Um, one assessment just for one uh, state, New South Wales, um, uh, uh, in excess of $200 million. Um, cost estimates of SDS hazards to specific sectors have also been undertaken. Um, I'll just show you two here, crude oil exports in um, uh, Kuwait, and they vary uh, uh, costs per ship in the millions of dollars. And aviation for flights cancelled, there was a recent study in the Canary Islands, um, February 2020, in which over a thousand flights were cancelled and a very conservative estimate of 21 million US dollars is the cost there and that's just for cancellations not for uh, diversions or delays. There have also been annual costs, um, uh, annual costs at various geographical levels, uh, relatively few of them. And I should say I, I, I shouldn't really show you this table because uh, all of these uh, few studies have all used different methodologies, both for collecting data and indeed for analysing them. But I'd, I show you it because it gives you some idea of the sort of relative uh, order of magnitude of costs. So the top four are for individual countries and we're talking about um, annual costs in the billions of US dollars and the bottom three here are for regions of countries and we're talking tens to hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, there are a number of other sectors about which we, we know perhaps even less. Um, uh, other forms of transport, road and rail lines and the impacts there are, are often extremely localised. They're, they're particular stretches of highways or uh, uh, rail lines which are susceptible. There's quite a lot of um, uh, research in the United States of America where it's a particularly widespread issue on the roads um, but I believe it's it's much more widespread internationally than that but there's very very few studies indeed. I mean Amin in his uh, uh, 
presentation earlier talked about glacier melt and water supply and there have been uh, there are an awful lot of knock-on issues related to uh, the hydrological cycle about which we know relatively little ICT water quality is another issue and uh, various other uh, aspects of the electric uh, electricity generation system um, my OK, conclusions. Um, I think it's fair to say that um, standard dust storms pose a serious hazard both in dry lands, but also beyond dry lands uh, due to long distance transport. Uh, the realisation of the importance of hazards is raising its policy profile, but research into these hazards and the disaster risk management implication of SDS uh, lags some way behind. Lack of data is a prominent challenge, as is lack of understanding and uh, academic literature on some, uh, on some impacts. Standardised methodologies for data collection and indeed for analysis is badly needed. Economic impact assessments also needed and um, uh, links to the same uh, Sendai framework monitoring uh, are important in that regard. And finally, uh, case studies of impacts in multiple countries are sorely needed for what is a transboundary hazard. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, <coughs> thanks very much, uh, Dr. Nicholas, for this interesting presentation with very uh, important conclusions with economic costing, standard, standardizing different methods uh, and uh, looking at uh, different case studies. So we thank you for this. We ran for uh, more than 11 minutes. So I would ask any participant if you want to communicate with uh, Dr. Nicholas now with your questions on the chat because now we will move to the actions at the national level, countries experience as we are done now with the regional and inter-regional collaboration. So let's uh, listen to these interesting panels. So I will turn over to now Leticia will start and then Carol will turn alternately with the country. So please, the floor is yours, Leticia. Thanks. Thanks to all speakers, of course, in the session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tarek, and indeed to all the speakers and the presentation that uh, Nick just gave us. I think it's a perfect segue to our uh, panel discussion now, where we are very pleased to welcome four uh, representatives from the countries in the regions, from four of the countries in the region, whom have graciously accepted our invitation to be here. And uh, so the way it's going to work is that Carol and I will ask them uh, specific questions. But I think the presentation, especially the conclusion slide, it really is very important for us to take um, inspiration about all the things that we could be thinking about working on together. So for the first question, I would um, invite um, uh, Mr. Abdul Basit Ramani. Uh, maybe to turn on his camera uh, is a senior advisor to the state minister in the state ministry for disaster management and humanitarian affairs of Afghanistan. Um, so, uh, Mr. Ramani, salam alaikum. Um, so I, would, I would like to ask you if you could uh, maybe elaborate on Afghanistan experience at national level with sand and dust storms also in light of the broader humanitarian challenges that Afghanistan is facing right now. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much for your uh, good organization from Mr. Muhappin and other colleagues that organized this program. Uh, uh, that's, uh, the, the presentation was very comprehensive and was very informative for us. Uh, you know, uh, in new days, the challenge in the, the, the world is going to uh, rise up. And uh, in Afghanistan, the hydrometeorological hazards are also uh, uh, going up. And uh, we are poor to the hydrometeorological uh, you know, Afghanistan is located in arid and semi-arid uh, geography, and uh, the drought and the sandstorm is uh, the permanent features of such of these countries. Uh, so, uh, 
another uh, challenge is that, you know, uh, the, the impact of the climate change also is the another uh, challenges or factor that uh, increased the sand and storm in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the uh, geography of Afghanistan is divided in uh, three categories. And uh, one category is uh, in the, in the uh, west of Afghanistan and in the, in the south of Afghanistan. In the west uh, of Afghanistan and south of Afghanistan, we are very prone uh, to the uh, dust and sandstorm. And uh, also, uh, this disruptive, uh, this, this act as a disruptive, Desired, uh, disaster or hazardous hazardous events and uh, can make some problem and some some challenges in, in different uh, sector uh, like in transportation in, in in life of the people in society uh, uh, in other areas but uh, we look to the way in Afghanistan as an opportunity and as a as a treat or as a disaster but unfortunately, because of law of the uh, adaptation and mitigation uh, to uh, the uh, impact of climate change and, and vulnerability of the disaster, uh, now we are facing the uh, treating and we are facing the hazard of the uh, uh, disaster, uh, particularly sun and storm in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, actually, uh, the, 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 when we look to the atlas of the sun and the storm in, Afg in the world and, 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 and look up in Afghanistan, uh, the, 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 in, in, a, in a, some areas we have a high speed uh, wind and th this caused this cause a lot of challenges to people. Uh, last year, uh, unfortunately, we have lost uh, three, uh, three person uh, in Afghanistan, uh, due to the uh, due to the ha happen of uh, a, a, a very intensive uh, wind, and uh, also wind wind is uh, the frequency and int intensity of the wind uh, is going uh, during the time going uh, up. And another challenge is you know the dryness uh, the dryness of the, this region, the dryness of the region. Uh, Close to the border of Afghanistan, in a western, in in, a, in western Afghanistan, in Nimruz and in Herat, the Hamun are going to uh, the Hamun on the lake uh, are going to be uh, uh, dry, and this dry is uh, make the region to be have more uh, dust, be have, be have, to have more particles uh, in a, in a in a way, and that it make uh, more problems and challenges to people of Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction. I see a hand up. Uh, Dr. Kumar Alabaksha. Alabakshi, would you like to take the floor now? We actually, actually, uh, we had agreed with the question. That, yeah. Sorry, I'm, please forgive me. Hello. Uh, Sir, Dr. Kumar, if you don't mind, uh, don't mind me. I, I, I saw that. <laughs> I realized I made a mistake. We agreed we would do all the questions in the end. If you don't mind me, uh, we will we will come back to you after all uh, the other panels have uh, uh, made their uh, comments. So if I would give now the floor to Carol. Forgive me, sir. We'll we'll take a, your question just we after all the panelists. Make time. Yeah, no, definitely make time for questions, and I'm and we're very uh, happy with the enthusiasm and and uh, the interventions. But if I could please ask uh, Mr. Haitham Belgrisi of Tunisia to turn on. Haitham, we see uh, start your camera, but we can't see you. I turn it on. Please. And if you could put your audio. And while you get yourself set up, um, we're very pleased to have you with us uh, representing Tunisia as we move from uh, Afghanistan towards the east and showing as well that dust and sandstorms are so important as we think about the Sahel and Mediterranean regions. So wonderful to have you with us, uh, Mr. Haysen Bagrisi, um, head of the short and medium uh, numerical prediction section in the National Institute for Meteorology in Tunisia. So we were, um, we'd like you to share with us um, 
your experience on how Tunisia, which is sitting right there on the northern um, uh, end of Morocco, of the African um, Penin uh, African continent, to say how you are dealing with SDS analysis and uh, how you are also addressing these transboundary challenges that are affecting from the Sahel to the Mediterranean, other uh, interregional networks that you are engaged with. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, I'd like to thank you all uh, the speakers before uh, for their uh, high quality talks. It's been really very informative uh, for us. So uh, as you know, Tunisia is uh, like all uh, countries in the region, uh, is exposed to uh, to sand and storm uh, issues. Uh, this exposure seems to be uh, to be maybe in the future more likely, uh, more and more um, observed and even uh, stronger, uh, knowing that uh, the climate projection that we have produced in the institute has shown that mean temperature will rise uh, according to RCP 8.5 by 5 degrees. If I could okay. ask everyone to close their mics and video, if you are not speaking, please. Mm. Except yeah. for the TCNI, of course. <laughs> okay. So as I've said, uh, as you all know, so um, Tunisia exposed, and it's, this exposure uh, seems to be uh, even uh, uh, more observed in the future, uh, knowing that uh, according to RCP 8.5, the mean temperature will rise by five degrees, and we will have uh, even less and less uh, precipitation. That uh, for sure will uh, will make uh, uh, the sand and dust storm uh, issues even uh, more challenging for us. So uh, to deal with the with this issue, uh, we guess we think we need to work on uh, two levels. Uh, the first level is at one hand we need to improve our forecast, which is passed necessarily by improving our numerical weather prediction models and system and tools that we do have in the Institute. And uh, on the other hand, we need we need maybe to implement an early warning system to diffuse the, 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 the uh, right information to the right person on the right time. Uh, so to do so, on the first hand, to, to, in order to improve our numerical weather predictions, we, um, as, you, as we know, Tunisia is a member of uh, Aladdin Consortium. It used to be Aladdin, now it's occurred. So uh, we work together, 16 countries in the region uh, to, uh, to improve the, um, the, the numerical weather models that we use, Aladdin, uh, Aram, and uh, Arpej. We acquired last year our new HPC, which allowed us to run um, the mesoscale Aram model with the, um, with the resolution of 1.3 uh, kilometers, which is a model that has been developed uh, specially to, uh, to predict or forecast uh, the extreme events in general and uh, heavy rains and uh, sandstorms in particular. We uh, as well work in the consortium to develop the physics uh, of, uh, of uh, the phys physics parameters of the model. And of course, we are working on uh, implementing a 3D VAR assim data simulation uh, cycling. Uh, which is quite challenging for us, uh, knowing that uh, the amount of observ data observations um, in our region is not quite enough uh, to uh, to guarantee a minimum of p-value or a minimum of uh, improvement using the, the using data uh, simulation cycling. But we are working on this point uh, as well. And uh, we intend as well to run uh, in the near future uh, Atom Dust, which is a model that is uh, which is developed specially to uh, to uh, to better um, uh, predict uh, sand and dust storm, which is which is uh, which I think our colleagues in, in Algeria are run, are using uh, already is, is run uh, they run already Aram Dust, and they really. Um, uh, contributed actively to develop uh, the model uh, within the consortium. Uh, so as I've said, Tunisia is a part of uh, Aladdin consortium, but now it's a part of Accord consortium, which is a bigger consortium. It's merged between two consortium, Aladdin and Her Herlam. So 27 countries has now joined forces, forces to, uh, to develop, uh, to exchange experience in developing um, uh, de developing the, the tools and the models that are using, especially mesoscale models. 
So this this in uh, in order to to improve our uh, our forecast. But on the other hand, uh, in Tunisia we start lately to uh, produce uh, what we call vigilance map uh, that concerns six major uh, extreme events. Among them, of course, the sand and dust storms. This uh, this map is produced twice a day and is to be used uh, to the um, uh, to the to the to the grand public and uh, also to the uh, most concerned authorities in order to take actions in uh, in the right uh, time so uh, that's you. our experience with Tunisia uh, yes we, we we hope that just the collaboration between the countries on the region uh, will be more and more uh, enforced i think and uh, empowered thank you so much for the invitation again Thank you for sharing this interregional and intercountry experience. Um, Leticia, to you for our third speaker. Yes, thank you. Um, our next uh, uh, speaker is uh, from the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Masoud Sajirshi. Uh, he's the deputy head of the Department of Environment. Um, Dr. Sajirshi, uh, if you would like to turn on your video. Um, I can't, I don't know if it's my video, I can't see you yet. Or maybe we, as Dr. Tajishi is not uh, immediately available, we may want to go into the- We can the go to Dr. Dashti and maybe you can um, uh, just connect. I'm trying to see if he's still connected sometimes. You know, we're in the region, the electricity sometimes go out over here. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and, um, okay. Well, why don't we go over um, uh, Dr. Hassan uh, Dashti? Would you like to turn up your, your screen while we get uh, the other speaker back online? Yes. Wonderful to see you. Good afternoon. Hi, you, Dr. Dashti. Um, uh, well, we were going to be, we were doing some ping pongs uh, geographically, but definitely um, the area around the Gulf is is most uh, affected from um, sand and dust storms that we've seen the presentation. I'm wondering if you could share with us, uh, you being the uh, chief metrologist and climatology uh, superintendent at the Department for Meteorology in the Directorate for Civil Ava Aviation, which shows the connectivity um, between your work and um, the transport sector. How are and what are the current trends for sand and dust storms in Kuwait, uh, uh, its implications for health and socioeconomic issues, and what, you're, what you are doing to uh, address these and foster regional collaboration to the sand? So please, uh, Mr. Hassan. Uh, in the beginning, I, I'd like to explain that uh, when we talk about the dust storm, there is a classification from the WMO that divide the dust, dust to three types. Uh, the dust storm and the rising dust, we call it blowing dust and the uh, suspended dust. Why they did this? Because, you know, uh, we there's an impact for the dust. It started from the dust storm, which is uh, uh, the impacts on the transportation and the infrastructure in the removing the uh, encouraged the sand due to the uh, dust uh, uh, damaging the the oil pipes and they cover it with the sand and the airplane engine have to main, to, do, to do the maintenance for the engine, which cost, uh, as they said, five million per uh, one case. And uh, the annual cost for, for uh, moving removing these sands, it's uh, like five million per year in Kuwait. So uh, the second one, which is the rising dust or the fine particles, this is, uh, has impacts on the health and the, the uh, I mean the health of the people. So uh, measures were taken by uh, measures were taken by Kuwait uh, ministries, all the ministries, in order to reduce because we are we are we are in the uh, uh, south south to Iraq desert and uh, we have the main source coming from Iraq for the dust storm, and we have also the local uh, sources. Uh, we have mainly or you can say five uh, main sources north of Kuwait near Bobian Island to the west, uh, near Salmi, al Shigaya, and we have the northwest, and we have the middle of Kuwait, like al, al Salabiya and the Kabd area. We have the uh, uh, north of the uh, Wafra farms. So these five uh, sources, main sources, the government tried to reduce the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the 
the, the, the dust from these sources. So many laws has been taken, a law of uh, quarries to stop using uh, decaying the desert to, and they have to uh, import the sand from other countries, law of the seasonal campaigning for the people, for the civil people, and they short the period, it should be even only in the uh, spring uh, season, law of the grazing, and this has to reduce uh, cutting the trees and uh, for the uh, people who has these, uh, I mean, uh, animals. And uh, the main uh, one, the main, uh, I mean, uh, effort was to expand the, and uh, expand the protected area in Kuwait and uh, for the natural reserves area. Now it's uh, almost 17% of the Kuwait area. And uh, they propose it to be 20% of uh, the whole area of Kuwait. And uh, we have a very good project, which is, we call it the Green Belt, started from the north of Kuwait it's to the west because the dominant wind is from the uh, north uh, west. So we can stop the, uh, I mean, we cannot stop the wind, of course, because it's not in our hand, but we can at least do something to the, to the land, to the ground. And these trees will, this belt will, uh, uh, reduce the uh, moving of the sands and it's uh, ab about maybe from 20 to 200 kilometers uh, to the west of Kuwait. So uh, this is the local, uh, I mean, efforts. And we have the, the uh, regional because it's it's uh, not a local uh, problem. It's a regional because I talk about the source, the main source coming from uh, west of Al Samawa and people from Kisar. Uh, they visited this area and uh, start uh, doing the uh, study about uh, why and how we can reduce this this source. And uh, it was uh, now the project is uh, going on and uh, now uh, UN Habitat they share this and Kuwait Fund and uh, Kesar and Kefas all these they are doing their best to uh, reduce and uh, rehabilitate this area and. Uh, as a metrology we, uh, department, they invited us to this problem and to monitor the changes in the in the uh, ongoing uh, project. So everybody doing uh, because you know we are before two weeks we faced ten days continuously ten days of dust storm, which is uh, due to the climate change. Uh, we now we, we are sure that there is something wrong <laughs> around us. So uh, that, of course, had a very bad impacts on the transportation and the health and activities. Uh, so this is what we have now. And uh, of course, as you know, in 2016, we reached 70, uh, 54 degree, which was the highest in the, in the region. So uh, that's why I, I have now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dashti. Um, very interesting and in showing the implications across the sectors there. Um, uh, Leticia, were we able to get Dr. Tarishi back online? Uh, well, I understand that uh, Dr. Tarishi needed to be excused because of an uh, urgent matter, but um, uh, I understand uh, Mr. Abbas Gouris, the head of Environment Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, is uh, ready to step in uh, and uh, participate in our conversation. So, um, Mr. Gouris, thank you uh, for your uh, flexibility and being with us. Um, so, we, we have discussed, um, so the question for you, is that uh, we've discussed in the course of this webinar how important it is to develop cross-boundary perspective while tackling the impact of sand and dust storms. And could I ask you to maybe comment on the potential for collaboration at regional and cross-regional level and what substantive areas amongst the ones we've touched on would be best suited for international collaboration in your view? Over to you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Do you hear me? Okay, I uh, thank you so much, uh, and uh, I apologize for uh, not having Dr. Tajishi on board uh, because of uh, a very urgent meeting that uh, they have uh, scheduled for him uh, uh, with a very short notice. Um, I just uh, what I wanted to to point out uh, with the participants was. Uh, what I uh, raised in the question and answer in the first part, and uh, I really do not have uh, uh, a lot to add to that. 
But to answer your question, um, I have to point out that we have uh, a number of uh, um, bilateral and multilateral agreements in the region with some other countries that is uh, that are for some years ago and it is a very good step for us to revive and to um, to uh, uh, reactivate those um, those agreements uh, and um, uh, arrangements with with the countries in the region i think the potential is in place Internationally, we have, as I said before, a number of uh, resolutions uh, adopted by the General Assembly and many other uh, specialized agencies of the United Nations. And also regionally, we have the arrangements with uh, some other countries in the region. Uh, we have multi multilateral or bilateral agreements and arrangements with them. And it is a very good uh, platform for us actually to uh, to revive them with the help of APTIM or SCAB and SQA because some of those countries are members of SQA and some others, uh, some of those countries are members of SCAB. So I think uh, we have to, um, in fact, I'm very happy that we are having this uh, this meeting um, today, this webinar with your help, uh, that we could talk to each other and we could address the, the issue uh, from different perspective and from the perspective of different regions. So it is, it is a very important webinar. I think the best way is to build on um, uh, the arrangements that we have in the region and we uh, uh, try to add some countries and to synergize with the help of a uh, global uh, coalition uh, to combat sand and dust storms. And I'm sure that we will have a very good cooperation and coordination between the in uh, between and among the regions uh, for to to deal with uh, sand and dust storms. So um, I think for this for the first step, this is the uh, what we expected and uh, we are looking forward to having uh, more and more of these discussions and of these presentations that are very informative. And uh, I want here to uh, request to share those presentations if possible because they are very informative and they give us uh, very uh, detailed information on what's happening in other regions because what we have done in Iran, uh, you know, we have hotspots in Iran and outside Iran and uh, Mr. Tajishi uh, wanted to talk about the hotspots and addressing them inside Iran. So it is it is uh, uh, an issue on for the regional cooperation to address the hotspots outside of Iran because as you said and many others said this morning, uh, or this afternoon that this is a transboundary uh, challenge. So I thank you so much. I stop here and I thank everybody and I hope uh, uh, we will see you uh, and everybody soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, while I have the floor, maybe I'll take a moment to just try to wrap up this very intense uh, couple of hours that we spent together. Um, it's been really, uh, I think, a great opportunity to um, work together with our colleagues in ESCOA. As Mr. Goris would say, some countries are part of ESCOP and some of ESCOA, but we're all working in the United Nations with the same umbrella and uh, working with Carol, Tarek and uh, Marlene, the colleagues in, um, in uh, uh, ACCP has been a, a pleasure over the last weeks to prepare for this and I'm sure we will have more work to do, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, taking up all the fruitful discussions that has come up here. Um, clearly there is knowledge, clearly there is understanding of what the problem is in the region. I think we've shown that we've done good progress and also incredible capacities in the countries in the region. Um, we also need to understand more though, especially in certain um, areas and um, also in, in terms of, as Nick was saying, understanding some of the uh, ways in which we collect the information and maybe standardize some of that. Um, but I also picked up uh, a clear uh, signal of interest from virtually all the speakers about the need to or, or the hope for enhancing collaboration. And that is something that uh, I for Updem, I can speak for Updem, but hopefully for colleagues in ESCO as well will certainly take on board, um, roll up our sleeves as we say in English and really put our heads together and see what can we take forward 
and 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 work together to uh, even uh, to 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 make some of the conversations and the expression of interest a bit more concrete that we've had today. I must apologize with the gentleman that had asked for the floor that I could not give to, um, and hopefully he he can put the comments online. I also should say that. Uh, all the presentations will be made available online. Um, we will send them to you and we'll, they will be on our website, just as will be the, web, the recording of this, uh, of this session. And uh, with that, I really warm thanks to all. And uh, Carol, any last words from you? Yes, um, I really think that this is um, rather landmark to see the range of, of different regions, different countries that are coming together to start this conversation. Um, there is a significant knowledge base. And I'd like to highlight that also there's different perspectives when we look at this. I mean, your um, center, uh, Leticia, looks at disasters. Our center looks at climate change. We are talking about different sectors and different ways of also addressing the questions. So as we look also across regions, um, uh, our colleagues here talked about different methodologies, different ways to assess costs, uh, look at different sectors, but also looking at it whether it is through disaster risk reduction methodologies or adaptation as well as we move beyond the um, assessment phase and finding ways to actually incorporate this and mainstream in this uh, responses uh, through our development plans and sector plans um, to alleviate the impacts that is happening on our economies and our societies. So with that, thank you everyone for- um, Shall we take uh, very, a group photo yeah. if everyone oh. wants to take a turn on their can videos? Can we do it in teams? Will it come up in teams for more than three? But we can try. Everyone open their, their mic, their, their videos. We'll see how many we can uh, get on the screen. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, this is the problem with Teams and not Zoom, but at least we can get a, a handful in there. <laughs>